Hey, good morning. Welcome today. And uh, we're going to jump in today is the beginning of a, of a new sermon series. And we're going to talk about being a mature Christian. And as a people, we want to be a mature church. And that implies when we talk about maturity that birth is not the end. There is a growth that needs to take place. There is more that needs to come. And uh, this series is going to be through 1 Corinthians. And so I think we're going to see a lot of uh, different issues come up in the church at Corinth. Uh, for example, they, they had a lot of issues that are, are things that we still deal with today. Some of the same kind of problems. There's issues of conflict and division in the church. There's issues of sexual ethic. There's uh, issues that, uh, about marriage, the principles of marriage. All those kinds of things come to play. Uh, there are issues of spiritual gifts. In other words, what are the spiritual gifts? What are, how are they rightly used, rightly defined, appropriate? What is love? What is real love? These kinds of things come up. Uh, and then even the, the you got to remember that we're, we're dealing with first, second generation Christians when we look at this letter from Paul who started the church in Corinth and what's going on in Corinth. And their, one of their concerns is, what happens after you die? That's a question I think we need to ask as well. So what happens to my body? What about the resurrection and those kind of things? So let me give you a little background as we jump into Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Corinth is on the Greek peninsula. Uh, there should be a map come up on your screen here. And uh, is on the, on the Greek peninsula. It's part of Greece. And Corinth was a, a, a very diverse Roman, uh, Roman presence, a Greek presence, uh, even a Jewish presence. Uh, it was kind of the premier kind of a city or uh, of its time. It was a progressive place. Uh, Corinth was where Rome defeated the, uh, uh, the Greek, uh, all of the Greek city-states came together to oppose the Roman expansion of the Roman Empire. And it was kind of at Corinth where they were defeated. And, uh, and then the Roman Empire, though, rebuilt Corinth as kind of their hub for Greece almost. And so uh, you have, even in uh, history, uh, historians will tell you that much of Roman culture was derived from Greek culture. So they assimilated, if you will, uh, even the worship, the pagan worship, the idols and, and the different gods, they assimilated a lot of that into their practices, into the Roman practices. So there was a lot of religious uh, influences in Corinth uh, that mainly were, were pagan. Uh, but Corinth was also an economic influencer. They had access to sea and uh, transport in lots of different ways. It was a large uh, and in the, at the time, it was a large, what they would have considered a very modern city for its time. All right? So it was the hub religiously, economically, culturally, uh, in so many different kinds of ways. Intellectually, there, it was a hub in many ways. And in the midst of this city that had so many influences in it, Paul, the apostle, comes, starts a church at these preach to the people there, and there is a band of Christians that are there. You know, we live in a time where information is so readily available to us. You maybe have uh, Amazon Echo or a Google Home, Microsoft Cortana, uh, Apple phone, you have Siri, all these kinds of things. And, and with those kind of artificial intelligence computers, uh, they can, you can ask them questions, you can give them direct They'll obey certain commands and so on and so forth. And we, we stay, we as a people are, are a people who remain connected um, through internet, through smartphones, through our computers, through these, these different avenues with databases that surround the world. There's, there's very limited information that if you didn't search long enough, you couldn't find through these kinds of things. And uh, uh, we, we can really, in fact, I really believe some people suffer from information overload. Whether it be social information, that you're looking for information through people uh, about what's going on in people's lives. You can get on social media and you can follow people. You can figure out what people are having for dinner if they post that on there. I mean, we just have information overload. But I want you to understand as we begin to delve into the Word of God that there is some information. There are some things that you cannot learn. Listen, you cannot learn 
from a computer. It doesn't matter how well or how fast your internet access is. There are some things that you must learn in other ways. And there are some things that the Spirit of God wants to teach us today and every day. And it will come not through your uh, data uh, coverage, but it will come through the Spirit of God. So as we get in, turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul's letter, uh, letter, he's got two letters that we have, First and 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians, and it's right after Romans in your New Testament. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? This is Paul opening up his, in his letter to the church that is in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at the first verse, the Bible says this. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. And that in every way you were enriched in Him in all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks today for the Word, for uh, this that has been passed down uh, to us over uh, years, uh, almost 2,000, around 2,000 years, Lord, this word. But I'm thankful today, dear God, that it has not lost its potency, its power, its relevance for us even today, dear God. And the same problem of sin that existed and, and uh, faced these early Christians in Corinth, Father, is the same problem that faces us today in the hour in which we live. And we pray, God, your spirit would guide us as we embrace your truth, Father. May we be more than hearers. May we be doers of the word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You could be seated. You have to know this, this church in Corinth, this church was a church that had a lot of problems, okay? This was not uh, your ideal kind of a church. Uh, no church has no problems, maybe, because they're made up of people and people have problems. But this church is, uh, had some significant issues. And one of the, the difficulties of a first-generation church, of a, of a New Testament church, is that you're starting in many ways, especially in a place like Corinth. And although you have some Jews who have maybe the Judeo-Christian values that they are already, uh, Judeo values that they're already bringing to the table, so the morality, some of the morality issues are already solved, much of the, many of the Christians of, of Corinth were not necessarily Jewish in background. Some of them were, but not all of them were. And so you have them coming from pagan backgrounds without an understanding of morality as defined by God and uh, uh, what we call Judeo-Christian values and morality uh, was absent from them at this time. And even though there were these issues facing them adjusting now, we've got to adjust our sexual ethic, if you will. We've got to adjust our understanding of how we get along in the life of, of the church as believers? How do we interact with one another? How do we um, uh, work with one another? Those kinds of things. Those are all realities that they're dealing with. Even what it means to have spiritual gifts. All right. Uh, Paul will with uh, a little later, even in this first chapter, about the fact that Greeks are always looking for signs. They're looking for miraculous. They want, they want, hey, show us some power. Show us something that will shock us, and then we'll we'll follow behind you. Those kinds of things. And so those things all had to be corrected. 
And, and as we read Corinthians, you will find that Paul corrects, he rebukes things that are not in line with what God has called us to do, to believe, to live, uh, ethic and lifestyle. All these kinds of things are impacted by, uh, by the world around them. And Paul is correcting that. But first thing that he does is he wants to remind them. And the basis for any ethic, the basis for our lifestyle, the basis for our way of life starts with our identity. And so he starts out the very first thing. This is important, okay? If you can make three observations about either scripture. The first one is this, that he makes an observation of who they are as the church. And he has a very high view of the church. He has a very high view of what it means to be a part of the body body of Christ. And it's, it's important. It's something that needs to be considered. It's something that, that cannot uh, uh, approach just casually, but it's like, hey, remember who you are first and foremost. In fact, this is not the only time that Paul writes to a church and says, hey, remember who you are. It's important about who you are. Listen to what it says. he says in his letter to the church in Ephesus in chapter 5, uh, the last part of verse 25, it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Praise the Lord. What a different way of talking about the church than we talk about the church today. Now, let me just clarify a few things. Number one, we're not simply talking about an organization. We're talking about the people. We're not talking about a building. We're not talking about an institution, if you will. We're talking about the body of Christ that is referred to as the church. And the church, those who have been born again. I'm not even talking about membership, all right? I'm not talking about whether you're a member or not of the church. I'm talking about uh, uh, in an official kind of a capacity. But membership in the body of Christ comes not through signing a piece of paper and agreeing to doctrine or whatever. It comes from a real life encounter with Jesus Christ that changes your identity, that changes your lifestyle, that changes everything about you. And Paul's saying, before I get into anything else uh, in, in my letter and in, in direction, about how you're to live and clarifying doctrine and all those kind of things. I want you to understand that uh, you are the church, the church of God. That he says you're the church of God. Those sancti sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's important. They're sanctified. He said called to be saints. Now there are some churches out there, for example the Catholic church, you can never become a saint until after you die. But here's what Paul's saying to the church in Corinth. He said you are called to be saints. So be of them. Be saints. What is a saint? A saint is a sanctified person. A saint is someone who's been made holy by the presence of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord our Jesus Christ. What Paul will rebuke and correct throughout the rest of his letter is not the character of, of the church. All right, uh, the church of God is a holy people. What he is correcting is deviations from that character. All right, and so what he's giving is not a critique of the church per se, but of individual behaviors and doctrines or teachings that do not line up with who they are in Jesus Christ. And that's important. That's important. So, uh, number one, I would note there's a high view. God has a high view of his church, of his bride, of, of his body, the body of Christ. And then, number two, I want to point out this idea of enriching grace. There's this concept here in verse 5. He says that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. So Paul thanks God for the grace of God at work among the Corinth 
Corinthian Christians, and, and we praise the Lord for God's grace at work among us. And I don't know about you, but I want to be someone who is a recipient of the grace of God, is living daily in recognition that God's grace is, is working in me, not just to see that I'm born again, not just to see that I'm sanctified through and through, but there is an enriching grace. And he says that this is in every way. You're enriched. Now, we live in a time where there are some who want to uh, use the grace of God as an excuse for their sin. They want to use the grace of God as a, as a, as a kind of a, a opting out of the challenge of the Word of God and the challenge of the Holy Spirit to grow and to mature in Jesus Christ. And to say, well, I know that's the way I am, and, but God's grace covers me and all that. When the reality is, God's grace takes away our excuse to remain where we're at. Our excuse to remain at the level spiritually that we're at, to, re to remain in the same lifestyle, and uh, actions that we've always been. And, uh, and the grace of God actually is a challenge before us, but also the ability for us to mature, to grow, to be enriched in every way. And it specifically says, in all speech and all knowledge. Uh, I just I think it's a challenge that we need to put out, and I want to put to you as, a, as your pastor, listen, I, I understand that you can exist without putting your place, putting yourself in a place, or allowing yourself to be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. But you will miss out on the enriching work of grace in your life. The Holy Spirit ministering in, in that kind of way. God's grace is not to be used as an excuse for sin or for infancy, spiritual infancy, but actually is, is the promise that we have. Grace is the promise that we have that He can take us in our brokenness, in our immaturity, in our sinfulness, in our wickedness, in our bend away from Him, in our, in our perversion, wherever we once, once were. And the grace of God is a bridge that takes us into the future of maturity and growth and life change. There is something enriching about the grace of God. And that's what Paul tells the church. Praise be to God for this enriching that takes place. Uh, you know, everybody's tired of talk, right? Here's what he says in verse 6. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So he talks about this enriching grace. And then it leads in to saying, how, how do we know grace is at work within you? Because it's evident to everyone around you. The, you the, the testimony of Jesus Christ has been confirmed in you. It's, it's real. It's evident to other people. It's like, hey, what the Bible says is illustrated in your life. It's, it's being shown in your life. It's not just talk. It's not just a preacher getting up on Sunday, preaching a nice message, and we say, well, that's great. Now we're going to go home and do our thing or whatever. But this enriching grace is real, and it is affirming the, the testimony of Jesus Christ in our lives. No more just talking big. Not so, not, no more of this stuff. Oh, I love Jesus so much, but I'm not living for Him. No more of this. God can do anything, but you're still living bound up and, and strapped down. No more of that. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 says, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. There's this reality that these things are not just philosophical things that, that are out here in the atmosphere somewhere, but they impact our life. And when God's grace is at work in you, it will be confirmed in your life. That's important. It just will. Thus, you have everything you need. He says in verse 7, not lacking in any spiritual gift because the enriching grace of God is working in your life. And then finally, the third thing is God's sustaining grace. Power. Now, this is important for us to look at verse 7, last part, and then verse 8. The Lord Christ will sustain you to the end. Praise the Lord. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am so glad that during uh, uh, pandemics, during turmoil in the world, during whatever may be going on around us, during economic low times, during disease, during difficulties, during trials, the grace and the power of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, He will sustain you to the end. Praise the Lord. God is in it 
to win it. He's in it to the end. He didn't come in, wave a wand, and then leave. He will sustain you to the end. Now, the word, in the, I, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The word is sustain. But the NIV translate that to keep you firm to the end. The King James says, we'll confirm you to the end. The, the New Revised Standard Version says, we'll strengthen you to the end. Because God sanctifies his church, because he enriches all speech, all knowledge, because his grace is confirmed in the testimony of his people, because his people are not lacking in any spiritual gift, he will sustain them to the end. Praise the Lord. Now, sometimes we get caught up in the, there's a lot of doc, uh, um, ideologies that come in behind this or doctrines that come in behind this. And there are some people who believe once in grace, always in grace. All right. And, uh, and so, if we're not careful, though, we can react against this idea, and we can even reject this truth, where he says, Jesus Christ himself will sustain you to the end. He'll walk with you all the way. God keeps up his end of the covenant. That's why we can say, God is faithful. We sing about the faithfulness of God. We sing about the fact that God, He keeps us. He is our sustainer. Great is thy faithfulness. He gives us strength. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race race. I have kept the faith. That's Paul talking on his end. That's the response to this sustaining power of God. This is what he wants to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 and it says, and we all are being transformed into the same image. That's Christ, the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. There is this power uh, of uh, the enriching grace, but there's also a power that is moving through that's graciously given to us that what God began in your life when you were born again, he has not stopped then left you as a spiritual infant. But if you would pursue him, if you would allow yourself to be in a place where you say, even so, come Lord Jesus, work in my life. I'm available to you. I want to be shaped by you. There is a power that is sustaining that will not just get you through this life, that will not just help you through the hardships of life, but you will grow and you will mature and you will strengthen in the midst of adversity. And you say, well, man, I don't know. It's so hard, but we have not seen the kind of persecution that the church of Corinth saw. We're not seen the kind of persecution that throughout history, many different Christians in many different areas, whether they be uh, oppressed in whatever way, have seen. And yet I will tell you that where the church is persecuted, where they are um, attacked, where the enemy is working powerfully against the church, we can see all the more the enriching grace of God and the sustaining power of our God working in the midst to see us through all the way to the end. And we don't have to crawl into heaven. We don't have to wheelchair our way in. We're not going to be carried into heaven by angels. But we can go there with the power of God. Praise be to God. Most of the struggle of, of Christians today, I think, and sometimes uh, the reason they struggle so much is because we resist this grace. We resist this enriching grace. Uh, the call of the Holy Spirit from the time of our new birth is always to grow, is always to, and we've, and somewhere along the way, we've learned how to snuff that out. We've learned how to resist that. We, we're uncomfortable because we get to places where we don't want to give up certain things. We don't want to let some certain things change in our life. We're unwilling to grow. And the more we quench that spirit, the more difficult we find ourselves in. But here from the very beginning, Paul says to the church, he's like, hey, you are called to be saints. You weren't called to be spiritual infants. You're not called to be immature Christians. You're not called to be the same place that you were 10 years from now, be in that same place again. And what I fear in my heart is that there are too many people that I will serve as pastor that in a decade from now, if the Lord tarries, they'll be in the same place they are today. And that same place they are today is the same place they were 10 years ago or 5 years ago or however many years ago. And they have neglected the enriching grace of God. They have neglected the sustaining power of God. Don't you sustain as keep you where you're at, but sustain you in the midst of a darkening, de uh, destructive, dying world. 
that we can know the fullness of God and continue to grow in Him, to become more and more like Him. The church is really a beautiful, sanctified, it's a holy family. It's those in Christ have everything necessary to live and fulfill God's will for their lives through His enriching grace. We will sustain, he will sustain us until he comes again, returns, because he is faithful. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What you cannot find, listen, what you cannot find from Echo or Siri or any of these others is God's call for you. They won't be able to share that with you. But I want you to know today we've, we've opened up the Word of God here in Corinthians. And the call is clear. You were to be set apart for holy purposes. That's God's call on your life. Your call is not simply or only to experience forgiveness of sins. But that is the beginning of a journey that the roots, your spiritual roots would grow deep and that you would bear much fruit as you endeavor to honor Him. I want you to stand with me today if you would.